Welcome to another magical, mystical, and dysfunctional episode of What Happened. The show where... <sighs> screw it with the pleasantries. We have to talk about Zelda CDI now. Great! I'll grab my stuff! This whole story is a ghastly nightmare that would make even the most insidious sleep paralysis demons blush with envy, and for a variety of reasons. We got shoestring budgets, short turnaround times, shoddy hardware, limited experience in the development of video games, and of course, Russia. But before we get into the nitty and or gritty on how Nintendo frivolously loaned out one of their most treasured franchises, which resulted in it being featured on this show, we have to quickly discuss the dusty decaying husk that is the CDI system, a piece of hardware that I wish I could just stop acknowledging right now. <laughs> Unlike, say, the Jaguar or the Gamecom, which are charmingly bad, what with their interesting ports and bizarre exclusives, the CDI is just very bad. It's a pitiful collection of circuit boards barely resembling anything that could possibly hope to entertain the human mind, whether that be the most discerning adult or children 3 to 6. How about a nice relaxing afternoon of murder and betrayal? So, as much as I'm against it, the CDI will be referenced here approximately... Ah. Okay, let's just do this. Nintendo was entertaining several companies to help design and manufacture a CD-based add-on for the mighty Super Nintendo, with Sony and Philips as the front runners. Nintendo then thought better of the whole idea at the last second when they saw the reception of the Sega CD and decided they would reclaim their moniker as the Pullout King. Ask any of my exes. I'm the Pullout King. I don't get anyone pregnant. Now, these plans had been far along with Sony, but decidedly less so with Philips. And by now, I think we all know how things turned out with the former. The initial deal with Philips also fell apart, thank God, but they didn't come away empty-handed, since Philips were also making their own video game console at the same time. Ooh, no, that's, uh, that's a strong word for it. Uh, let me take that back. Uh, it, since they were making their own fancy VCR that Nintendo didn't see as a threat. So they decided to toss Philips a bone or two. A good portion of the information contained from here on out comes from an interview via Retro Gamer magazine with one Dale DeSharon, who had led several projects on the CDI in its earlier days and was chiefly the man responsible for the deformed curios we are about to dissect, which of course were Zelda, the Wand of Gamelon, and Link, the Faces of Evil. According to Mr. De Chiron, Philips didn't acquire the Zelda or Mario licenses from Nintendo, but rather Nintendo let them choose up to five different franchises of whatever the hell they wanted to work on, an unprecedented amount of free reign. Can you Imagine that today, Nintendo going up to any one company or, or multiple companies and letting them just fill their plates at the Nintendo buffet. Arc System Works, uh, developing a new Punch-Out, a frictional made Eternal Darkness sequel, or uh, Namco making a Legend of Zelda fighting game. No, no, no. Nah, Phillips, man. The, the, these guys are good. Yeah, they'll, they'll knock it out of the park. Unfortunately, they didn't. They really, really didn't. And there was always going to be at least one massive roadblock as to why. The CDI was not primarily designed as a games console per se, but rather an educational or interactive media player, which feels so gross just saying it. With that in mind, it means that even if the team assigned to this pointless endeavor had tons of experience, money and time, the end result was probably always destined to appear on what happened. Disharon minced few words when speaking about the prowess, or lack thereof, of the glorified fancy VCR. The CDI was dreadfully slow and severely limited. If you look at the scrolling, you'll see it only scrolls about 2.5 screens horizontally. This was dictated by the video memory available. It was just 
obviously not a game system, and Philips was actually very clear in telling us that they didn't believe the market for CDI was games. So that's not good. Despite this, Philips Interactive Media, the game publishing arm of Philips, contacted Dale DeSharon and his new company, Animation Magic, to see if they wanted in on this momentous milestone moment. Dale and his team then proposed that they make an engine that could run multiple games, thus getting more bang for their buck, which was a great idea as they would definitely need to get those bang bucks because... Most of the people at Philips weren't game people, so we pitched ideas for two titles, one starring Link and one with Zelda. The development budgets were not high, they were around $600,000 per game. Coupled with that, Philip had mandated that all titles had to make use of every single feature the fancy VCR had, which were... 1. High resolution graphics, which maxed out at a luxurious 600 by 400. 2. CD quality music, citation needed. And 3. Video playback capabilities. That last one though, <laughs> that was an absolute must. The problem is that that combined 1.2 million to make two titles was a paltry sum even back then. I mean, uh, by comparison, The Room had cost $6 million to film. Where's my fucking money, Denny? So all of that money was going to be stretched thin to pay the entire team to help them, you know, live for the next 12 months plus. So they had no money to pay animators that they didn't even have. Yes, at the time, no one at Animation Magic could animate, at least on budget, so Mr. DeSharon would need to find creative, but much more importantly, frugal solutions. So, who did he turn to? A mutual friend put me in touch with Igor Razbov. The Berlin Wall was coming down, and Igor wanted to return to St. Petersburg to build a studio there that would provide a service to U.S. companies. I had seen numerous animated films coming out of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, so I thought, well, we could probably do animation over there. So Igor found about six people who had experience with 2D animation, and they all had varying levels of skill. Why, whatever do you mean? Oh, lucky shot! Golly! Now, while the cutscenes of One of Gamelon and Faces of Evil are certainly ripe for finger pointing and eye gouging, the rest of the team at Animation Magic struggled to create a competent side scroller on the CDI, especially given their past experience. Since most of the fancy VCR's library was comprised of things like encyclopedias, point and clicks, and uh, other, the graphical artists working on both Wand of Gamelon and Faces of Evil were not accustomed to the traditional methods of laying out levels in the early 90s. Instead of using a grid-based system and kind of mapping out the levels in a long string which was conducive to precisely placing objects, pits, and enemies, they just just made digital paintings. This was where the team's experience lied, making colorful artwork that, while nice to look at, was way more form than function. Although this had the nice added benefit of fitting into the mandate that the graphics had to retain that crispy high resolution. So the artist painted and the artwork was scanned in and that's your level. Of course, building a game like this was not the best way to develop a side scroller where you needed to, you know, accurately hit things and be aware of level boundaries and such. Which is why you got shit like this. Oh come on, you gotta be kidding me. Music was also another problem that was both not well thought out and hampered by the CDI. While the compositions are certainly lively, 
They are of course a far cry from literally every Zelda OST you can name. If you have Zelda in your title, you have to bring your A game when it comes to music, as the franchise contains melodies that are good enough to be played by a symphony orchestra, which they are. Regardless, the music was recorded with little idea of how it would be implemented into the game. The composers simply recorded for however long they felt they needed. Now, because of the slow CD drive that the CDI employed, and how short most sub-levels were by design, each stage would end far faster than the music, which would then result in the song still playing and then restarting every time a new area was loaded. What a mess. I mean, I'm just saying, maybe don't make an action game for an electronic box whose killer app was the flowers of Robert Maplethorpe. Maplethorpe's flowers are equally sensual. Audio issues were not limited to just the music, since all the animation was made by the six best Russians that very little money could buy, they also needed a lot of time in which to do so, like most typical hand-drawn animation. So because of the long lead time these cutscenes would need, combined with poor communication and planning, voice actors delivered their lines with certain accents and inflections at the time of recording, with little clue as to what their character characters actually looked or would behave like, because they hadn't even been designed yet. So that's why several, e.g. all of the horrific mockeries of humanity you meet in both games, have voices that don't quite match their appearance. That ought to do it. Works pretty good. As for the quality of said voiceovers, well, voice speech in video games was barely a thing in 1993, and since their budget was tighter than Sheik's spandex, we auditioned local American Federation of Television and Radio Artists union actors, and then chose the voices from those auditions. There's about 10 minutes of animation in each title, so there was a fair amount of audio to edit. Imagine just sitting blurry-eyed at a computer, sweat just pouring from every orifice, and having to edit shit like this. I may be hideous, but after a year of being frozen, you will beg to join me. <laughs> In terms of how Wand of Gamelon and Faces of Evil play, which is almost identically, a lot of the design came down to animation magic being given carte blanche on almost everything. But what about those rumors that Nintendo had absolutely no involvement when it came to the design, objectionally the most important part? Well, Mr. Ducheron cleared that up. Yeah, they didn't. We came up with the design for Philips. There was quite a bit of creative freedom, so Philips had very little input. For Nintendo, we ran the design document and character sketches past them for approval. They were mostly interested in the look of the Link and Zelda characters, but not much else. Given the problems with the side view perspective the game utilized, obviously taken after the adventure of Link, it's a bit curious as to why Animation Magic didn't opt for a top-down perspective, considering the original 1986 Zelda and Link to the Past, released just two years earlier, employed to great effect. Well, they didn't really have a choice. I think Philips would have never have approved that, believing it looked old and wasn't making use of the CDI capabilities. They would have just looked at it visually as opposed to gameplay. That was what they were most concerned with. Does the CDI game look visually different from other systems games? And are we making use of the graphics? The possibility that Top Down might have been more fun wouldn't have affected them. That just might be the most unsurprising, surprising thing I've ever heard of. Because it's pretty clear that Philips didn't really care about what was getting made. Hell, they had permission to use franchises whose roster of level 1 enemies would have far more fans than their entire console ever would. So ultimately, they didn't really value the deal that they had fallen ass backwards into. Getting really recognizable characters on a non-Nintendo system was something you'd almost never see again. No, let's just lowball some unexperienced team and a bunch of Russian Animaniacs into farting these things out. You know, th that's good enough. 
Thus, with all these constraints and issues, DeSharon and his team had a rough time making both games, as you've probably suspected by now. It was a rough time making those games. I would be going back and forth, working with the programmers, working to build the engine, back to the animators, going through the script, and teaching them the process of how to get the animation done. Also, I had hired more US-based artists to make the game artwork itself. We were working on both titles simultaneously, on the script, on the design, and the artwork, everything at the same time. We had maybe just a little over a year to produce them, so it was pretty tight. After all the trials and tribulations, both titles released on October 10th, 1993, and no one really cared. See, the CDI failed to make any sort of dent, um, anywhere. And fortunately for Nintendo, both games came and went with little notice from the general gaming populace. That is, until almost 20 years later, when an invention called the Internet shone new life on these bastard children spawned from a deal that I'm getting increasingly suspicious was brokered while a Nintendo executive was drunk. The entire accursed CDI X Nintendo lineup was being dredged up again, with many people getting a glimpse of the horrific forms for the very first time. This also includes Zelda's Adventure, the third title that Animation Magic had nothing to do with. This resulted in countless people lambasting every game, while also laying a nice, stinky foundation to many a YouTube poop video. Then you can help. In the morning. When asked by Retro Gamer for a reaction to all of these, um, then you can be tough and come on to Ganon's beautiful face. Opinions on both Zeldas, Mr. De Sharon shrugged. We had been aware of criticism following the release of the games. I can understand that people were disappointed. I guess they made comments about the animation, but also the gameplay and design. Given the time we had, I thought we did a good job. You know, Nintendo makes fantastic games, which are all well-tuned in terms of gameplay, and they have amazing games designers. I would imagine that anything was going to fall short of that. At the same time, Philips wanted more production values in terms of music, visuals, and animation. That's what they were pushing us to do. You put effort into that, and it doesn't go elsewhere. It could have been better. Philips, of course, is still in business today, but has since greatly distanced themselves from anything approaching interactive entertainment since the CDI. Shocking, I know. Dale DeSharon no longer works in the industry today, but his company, Animation Magic, actually survived for almost another decade. That is, until they befell Blizzard Entertainment teaming up for Warcraft Adventures Lord of the Clans until that was mysteriously cancelled, which would be the actual death blow to the company. Now, furiously searching for that silver lining, in and around the Zelda CDI game's launch period, Nintendo was also farming out Mario in various unfun edutainment games, which were similarly poorly received. It's easy to see that because of these massive misfires that Nintendo took the experience to heart and for several years clutched these franchises close to their chest, becoming incredibly choosy about who gets to work on what. This then led to Capcom giving us some incredible Zelda titles, as well as several American studios delivering some all-time classics of their own. Hey, so in a roundabout way, you did it, Link! You saved the day! You, Link, are the hero of Koridai! I guess that's worth a kiss, huh? Huh! I won! Thanks to C24U for nominating these horrible affronts to interactive media. Now, if you'd like to nominate the game, movie, or etc. of your choosing, roll on over to the grassy fields of the Flophouse VIP Patreon to make that into a future episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs>